Section nine of Thoughts on Art and Life. Thoughts on Art, Part four. Painting and Nature. If you despise painting, which is the only imitator of the visible works of nature, you will certainly despise a subtle invention which with philosophy and subtle speculation apprehends the qualities of forms, backgrounds, places, plants, animals, herbs, and flowers, which are surrounded by light and shade, and truly this is knowledge, and the legitimate offspring of nature, because painting is begotten by nature. But, to be correct, we will say that it is the grandchild of nature, because all visible things are begotten by nature, and these, her children, have begotten painting. Therefore, we shall rightly say that painting is the grandchild of nature and related to God. Were a master to boast that he could remember all the forms and effects of nature, he would certainly appear to me to be graced with great ignorance, inasmuch as these effects are infinite and our memory is not sufficiently capacious to retain them. Therefore, O painter, beware lest in thee the lust of gain should overcome the honour of thy art, for the acquisition of honour is a much greater thing than the glory of wealth. Thus for this and for other reasons which could be given, first strive in drawing to express to the eye in a manifest shape the idea and the fancy originally devised by thy imagination. Then go on adding or removing until thou art satisfied. Then arrange men as models, clothed or nude, according to the intention of thy work, and see that, as regards dimension and size, in accordance with perspective, there is no portion of the work which is not in harmony with reason and natural effects, and this will be the way to win honour in thy art. Painting and Sculpture I have myself practised the art of sculpture as well as that of painting, and I have practised both arts in the same degree. I think, therefore, that I can give an impartial opinion as to which of the two is the most difficult. The most perfect requires the greater talent, and is to be preferred. In the first place, sculpture requires a certain light, that is to say, a light from above, and painting carries everywhere with it its light and shade. Sculpture owes its importance to light and shade. The sculptor is aided in this by the relief which is inherent in sculpture, and the painter places the light and shade by the accidental quality of his art in the places where nature would naturally produce it. The sculptor cannot diversify his work by the various colors of objects. Painting is complete in every respect. The perspective of the sculptor appears to be altogether untrue. That of the painter can give the idea of a distance of a hundred miles beyond the picture. The sculptors have no aerial perspective. They can neither represent transparent bodies nor reflections, nor bodies as lustrous as mirrors, and other translucent objects, neither mists nor dark skies, nor an infinity of objects which it would be tedious to enumerate. The advantage of sculpture is that it is provided with a better defense against the ravages of time. Although a picture painted on thick copper and covered with white enamel, painted with enamel colors and then put in the fire again and baked, is equally resistant. Such a work as far as permanence is concerned exceeds sculpture. They may say that where an error is made, it is not easy to correct it. It is poor reasoning to try and prove that the irremediability of an oversight renders the work more honorable. But I say to you that it will prove more difficult to mend the mind of the master who commits such errors than to repair the work he has spoilt. We know well that an experienced and competent artist will not make mistakes of this kind. On the contrary, Acting on sound rules, he will remove so little at a time that his work will be brought to a successful close. Again, the sculptor, if he works in clay or wax, can remove and add, and when the work is finished, it can easily be cast in bronze, and this is the last and most permanent operation of sculpture, inasmuch as that which is merely of marble is liable to destruction. But this is not the case with bronze. Therefore, the picture painted on copper which with the methods of painting can be reduced or added to, is like bronze, which when it was in the state of a wax model could be reduced or added to. 
and if sculpture in bronze is durable this copper and enamel work is more imperishable still and while the bronze remains black and ugly this is full of various and delectable colors of infinite variety as we have described above if you wish to confine the discussion to painting on panel i am content to pronounce between it and sculpture saying that painting is the more beautiful the more imaginative and the more copious and that sculpture is more durable but has no other advantage sculpture with little labor shows what in painting seems to be a miraculous thing to do to make impalpable objects appear palpable to give the semblance of relief to flat objects and distance to objects that are near in fact painting is full of infinite resources of which sculpture cannot dispose sculpture is not a science but a mechanical art because it causes the brow of the artist who practices it to sweat and wearies his body and for such an artist the simple proportions of the limbs and the nature of movements and attitudes are all that is essential and there it ends and shows to the eye what it is and it does not cause the spectator to wonder at its nature as painting does which in a plane by its science shows vast countries and far-off horizons the only difference between painting and sculpture is that the sculptor accomplishes his work with the greater bodily fatigue and the painter with the greater mental fatigue this is proved by the fact that the sculptor in practicing his art is obliged to exert his arms and to strike and shatter the marble or other stone which remains over and above what is needed for the figure which it contains by manual exercise accompanied often by profuse sweating mingled with dust and transforming itself into dirt and his face is plastered and powdered with the dust of the marble so that he has the appearance of a baker and he is covered with minute chips and it appears as if snow had fallen on him and his dwelling is dirty and full of chips and the dust of stone the contrary occurs in the case of the painter we are speaking of excellent painters and sculptors since the painter with great leisure sits before his work well clothed and handles the light brush dipped in lovely colors he wears what garments he pleases his dwelling is full of beautiful pictures and it is clean sometimes he has music or readers of diverse and pleasant works which without any noise of hammers or other confused sounds are heard with great pleasure there can be no comparison between the talent art and theory of painting and that of sculpture which leaves perspective out of account perspective which is produced by the quality of the material and not of the artist and if the sculptor says that he cannot restore the superabundant substance which has once been removed from his work i answer that he who removes too much has but little understanding and is no master because if he has mastered the proportions he will not remove anything unnecessarily therefore we will say that this disadvantage is inherent in the artist and not in the material but i will not speak of such men for they are spoilers of marble and not artists artists do not trust to the judgment of the eye because it is always deceptive as is proved by him who wishes to divide a line into two equal parts by the eye and is often deceived in the experiment wherefore the good judges always fear a fear which is not shared by the ignorant to trust to their own judgment and on this account they proceed by continually checking the height thickness and breadth of each part and by so doing accomplish no more than their duty but painting is marvellously devised of most subtle analyses of which sculpture is altogether devoid since its range is of the narrowest to the sculptor who says that his science is more lasting than that of painting i answer that this permanence is due to the quality of the material and not to that of the sculptor and the sculptor has no right to give himself the credit for it but he should let it redound to nature which created the material painting has a wider intellectual range and is more wonderful and greater as regards its artistic resources than sculpture because the painter is by necessity constrained to amalgamate his mind with the very mind of nature and to be the interpreter between nature and art making with art a commentary on the causes of nature's manifestations which are the inevitable result of its laws and showing in what way the likenesses of objects which surround the eye 
correspond with the true images of the pupil of the eye, and showing among objects of equal size which of them will appear more or less dark, or more or less clear, and among objects equally low, which of them will appear more or less low, or among those of the same height, which of them will appear more or less high, or among objects of equal size, placed at various distances one from the other, why some will appear more clearly than others. And this art embraces and comprehends within itself all visible things, which sculpture in its poverty cannot do, that is, the colors of all objects and their gradations. It represents transparent objects, and the sculptor will show thee natural objects without the painter's devices. The painter will show thee various distances, with the gradations of color producing interposition of the air between the objects and the eye. He will show thee the mists through which the character of objects is with difficulty descried, the rains which clouded mountains and valleys bring with them, the dust which is inherent to and follows the contention between these forces, the rivers which are great or small in volume, the fishes disporting themselves on the surface or at the bottom of these waters the polished pebbles of various colors which are collected on the washed sands at bottom of rivers surrounded by floating plants beneath the surface of the water the stars at diverse heights above us and in the same manner other innumerable effects to which sculpture cannot attain sculpture lacks the beauty of colors the perspective of colors it lacks perspective and it confuses the limits of objects remote from the eye inasmuch as it represents the limits of objects that are near in the same way as those of distant objects it does not represent the air which interposed between the eye and the remote object conceals that object but as the veils and draped figures which reveal the naked flesh beneath them it cannot represent the small pebbles of various colors beneath the surface of the transparent waters to the painter and thou painter who desirest to achieve the highest excellence in practice, understand that unless thou build it on the solid foundations of nature, thou shalt reap but scant honor and gain by thy work. And if thy foundation is sound, thy works shall be many and good, and bring great honor to thee, and be of great profit. When the work exceeds the ideal of the artist, the artist makes scant progress and when the work falls short of his ideal, it never ceases to improve, unless avarice be an obstacle. He is a poor disciple who does not surpass his master. Counsels He is a poor master whose work is exalted in his own opinion, and he is on the road to perfection in art, whose work falls short of his ideal. Small rooms or dwellings help the mind to concentrate itself. Large rooms are a source of distraction. The painter should be solitary, and take note of what he sees and reason with himself, making a choice of the more excellent details of the character of any object he sees. He should be like unto the mirror, which takes the colors of the objects it reflects, and this proceeding will seem to him to be a second nature. The Painter in His Studio in order that the favorable disposition of the mind may not be injured by that of the body, the painter or the draftsman should be solitary, and especially when he is occupied with those speculations and thoughts which continually rise up before the eye, and afford materials to be treasured by the memory. If thou art alone, thou wilt belong to thyself only. If thou hast but one companion, thou wilt only half belong to thyself endeavor less in proportion to the indiscretion of his conduct. And if thou hast many companions, thou wilt encounter the same disadvantage. And if thou shouldst say, I will follow my own inclination, I will withdraw into seclusion in order the better to study the forms of natural objects, I say thou wilt with difficulty be able to do this, because thou wilt not be able to refrain from constantly listening to their chatter, and not being able to serve two masters, thou wilt play the part of a companion ill, and still worse will be the evil effect on thy studies in art. And if thou sayest, I will withdraw myself so that their words cannot reach and disturb me, I, with regard to this, say thou wilt be regarded as a madman. 
but seest thou not that by doing so thou wilt be alone also advice to the painter the mind of the painter must be like unto a mirror which ever takes the colour of the object it reflects and contains as many images as there are objects before it therefore realize o painter that thou canst not succeed unless thou art the universal master of imitating by thy art every variety of nature's forms and this thou canst not do save by perceiving them and retaining them in thy mind wherefore when thou walkest in the country let thy mind play on various objects observe now this thing and now that thing making a store of various objects selected and chosen from those of lesser value and thou shalt not do as some painters who when weary of plying their fancy dismiss their work from their mind and take exercise in walking for relaxation but retain fatigue in the mind which though they see various objects does not apprehend them but often when they meet friends and relations and are saluted by them they are no more conscious of them than if they had met empty air end of section nine